Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Senator Sherrod Brown, Senator Cory Booker, Assistant Democratic Leader James Clyburn, Representative Bill Pasquale, and Mr. Larry Doby Jr. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you for being here. You can have a seat. Have a seat. Welcome to the United States Capitol and the People's House. The tradition of bestowing congressional gold medals uh, draws its foundations to the American Revolution, when the First Continental Congress gave this honor to General George Washington and the officers and soldiers under his command. They, they did that for liberating Boston from British occupation. It is the highest civilian award that is given in the United States, and every Congress has enjoyed this privilege since the award was first delivered to General Washington. The Congressional Gold Medal memorializes the extraordinary deeds and achievements of the recipients, of course. It initially only honored military service, but since has expanded to include those whose contributions are foundational to American history and culture. Today, pursuant to H.R. 5621, we will present the Congressional Gold Medal in honor of Lawrence Eugene Larry Doby in recognition of his achievements and contributions to the American Major League Athletics, Civil Rights, and the Armed Forces during World War II. Larry will be joining the ranks of our first president, the Wright brothers, Thomas Edison, Jackie Robinson, and so many others whose efforts to advance this grand experiment in self-governance have merited congressional commendation. As we begin this ceremony, Please join me in welcoming members of Larry's family and his son, Larry Doby Jr., uh, who will be receiving the award on his behalf this afternoon. Thank you for being here. We hope you enjoy the ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, Please stand for the presentation of the colors by the United States Capitol Police Ceremonial Unit, the singing of our national anthem by Sergeant First Class Keenan McCarter from the United States Army Band Pershing Zone, and the retiring of the colors. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave
ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the invocation delivered by the Honorable Cory Booker, United States Senator from New Jersey. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy, joy cometh in the morning. Today before the Lord Almighty, in this hallowed hall, in this sacred building, we are here to celebrate with joyous hearts the truth of talents, the truth of perseverance, the truth that we shall overcome. We give thanks, O Lord, for Larry Dolby, at a time of African-American excellence, adding to the greatness of the tapestry of our nation, we showed that indeed barriers can be broken, hurdles can be overcome, that the best of who we are can be recognized in full equality. We are thankful, dear Lord, for this great man, hailing from Patterson, New Jersey, this American who told our truth when others denied it, who showed our greatness when others besmirched it. Dear Lord, we are thankful that on this day we recognize a great American and indeed the struggles of great Americans who made this nation more noble, more true, and truly more united. Dear Lord, we give celebration in the words of that great poet, they may try to write us down in history with bitter, twisted lies. They may try to trot us into the very dirt, but still we, the people, shall rise. We give thanks for Larry Dolby. We give thanks for the recognition today that he shall be placed amongst the honored as a great American. Thank you. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Bill Pascrell, United States Representative from the 9th District of New Jersey. Good afternoon, everyone. Your family, Larry. We've been through a lot in the last 15 years, and thank you for your leadership. To the family, to the friends of Larry Doby. So happy to see many people here on this beautiful occasion. Speaker Johnson, thank you for organizing this event. Your first gold medal ceremony as speaker. Patterson, New Jersey, remember that. <laughs> and thank you, Leader Jeffries, for all of your support. I come from Patterson. I still live there. And I'm proud to say, so did my friend Larry Doby. He was a four sport star athlete, the pride of Eastside High. My wife was here, went to Eastside, and a pillar in the community. The abuse Larry endured would have destroyed most people, destroyed them. Unspeakable racism, countless threats. And all the time that I've known him, when I was young and wily, <laughs> Larry Doby never said a negative word about this. Even some of his own teammates shunned him. Larry Doby endured because of his unshakable courage, because of his incredible character. We cannot forget that Larry Doby played ball before interleague games. He was the first black baseball player to visit the American League ballparks. The example he set did not just break the American League color barrier, it helped set in motion a civil rights revolution in these greatest United States. A Navy veteran, he was so proud of that. 
We honored Larry with a postage stamp, a post office. He is rightfully in the Hall of Fame. A gold medal from Congress was the next step to remind Americans about his legacy. He was a good guy, a good man, a man of character. The city of Patterson is also recognizing Larry Doby's legacy with the refurbished historic Hinchcliffe Stadium, one of several parks across the country where we went to see black teams play. So proud of what they were doing, and rightfully so. I have high hopes that Major League Baseball will host the game at Hinchcliffe Stadium someday in the future. We came together, Democrats and Republicans, New Jersey, Ohio, South Carolina, to win this recognition. I can't think of a conversation I have had with Senator Brown the past 25 years that did not revolve around trade, manufacturing, and Cleveland baseball, Larry Byrne, Doby. Everyone wants to take credit for is this remarkable man, but all credit belongs to Larry, his beloved wife, Helen. and his beautiful family, <clears throat> excuse me. We live in polarizing times, but we can safely declare that Larry Doby, whether in Patterson, Montclair, Cleveland, South Carolina, was beloved to everyone. Larry Doby, a leader, a role model, a paradigm of the American dream, he deserves nothing less. And thank you for being here from the bottom of my heart. God bless you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable James Clyburn, Assistant Democratic Leader of the United States House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Leader of the Senate, the House, my colleagues, let me begin by thanking Larry Doby Jr. for being here today and thanking all of my colleagues for leading this effort to ensure that Larry Doby's story continues to be told. Growing up in South Carolina, Larry Doby got to get the record right. It was an inspiration for all of us. A native of Camden, South Carolina, Larry attended my high school, Mather Academy. He moved to New Jersey when he was 15 years old. I got to believe that all of the fundamentals were in place uh, by the time he left Camden. I played baseball in high school and college. And we had so much pride knowing that one of us had made it, even before a World Series championship in 1948. So I'm pleased that we are gathered here today to celebrate this pioneer and recognize how his contributions paved the way for many more to follow in his footsteps. Standing outside of the Camden Museum and Archives is a statue modeled after Larry and Bernard Baruch. As the first African-American player in the American League, he faced his share of harassment by fans and players alike. While traveling with the team, 
He had to stay in separate hotels and eat at separate restaurants. Even some of his teammates were slow to welcome him. But that did not deter Larry. He was well rooted in those first 15 years. He reconciled all that and he endured and continued to put his best foot forward, becoming an incredible baseball player and the second African-American team manager. It's fitting that this statue I just spoke of in Camden is called reconciliation because Larry Dobie showed us the path to reconciliation through the sacrifices he made in his life. Larry followed Jackie Robinson to the majors by three months and being second rather than first did not receive the same attention and fanfare. But this much is true. When the time came for Larry Dover to step up to the plate and do something memorable, he knocked it out of the park and became the first African-American to do the home run in a World Series game. Today, thanks in part to his sacrifices, countless players follow in his footsteps. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Sherrod Brown, United States Senator from Ohio. When we talk about integration of Major League Baseball, we hear about Jackie Robinson as we should, but too often the story stops there. We neglect the men who came soon after. Larry Doby is a key part of the story, a World War II veteran, first black player in the American League, second black manager in the major leagues, a civil rights pioneer. His bravery, his determination changed baseball. On July 4th, he was on the field for the Newark Eagles, a standout hitter and infielder in the Negro League. At all night, he rode the train from New Jersey to Chicago. And on July 5th, he was on the field for the Cleveland Indians. He didn't get to think about what he was walking into. He didn't play in the minors. He didn't have the time to build relationships and prove his value. When he walked onto the field in Chicago, he found himself playing a team sport, but was not treated like a teammate. Some players shook his hand, others his hand, others ignored him. That day he stepped in the field with a glove and a baseball, but no partner to throw with until Joe Gordon finally stepped up. He had to sleep, as Congressman Claiborne said. He slept in different hotels. He had to eat at different restaurants. He had to endure the incessant daily slights and the outright racism that teammates, opponents, and fans hurled at him. For Robinson and for Doby and the men who followed, the hard part wasn't just getting to the majors. It was proving every day that they deserved to wear the same jersey and be in the same field as did their white teammates and their opponents. Larry Doby did far more than prove he deserved to be there. He proved himself a baseball great. First black player, as, as Congressman Clyburn said, first black player to home run in a World Series, voted to seven American League All-Star teams. 1954, he led the league in home runs and RBIs, the key player on the record-breaking Cleveland Indians in their 111-win season, but he was passed over for most valuable player for whatever reason. He was signed on as an infielder, but he played the outfield when Cleveland asked him to. Alongside Satchel Paige, the first black pitcher, Doby led the Cleveland Indians to a World Series title. And as I'm sure Mitch McConnell would be about to point out, and Mr. Doby would understand, unfortunately they haven't won one since. <laughs> I take that personally. But 
Uh, Doby's accomplishments set him apart. His presence on the field changed baseball. 1947, second African-American player in the, in the major leagues. 1948, one of only seven. Doby laid the groundwork for baseball greats like Luke Easter and Satchel Paige, but he also laid the groundwork for more ordinary players like Dave Pope and Al Smith, who joined him in Cleveland. Players, people who dreamed of playing in the majors and deserved to, but for too long weren't considered because of the color of their skin. Today, when young Americans turn the TV on to a baseball game or arrive at a stadium, kids of all backgrounds see players who look like them, and they know one day maybe that can be them too. That mattered when Larry Doby walked on the field alone in 1947 after the all-night train ride. It matters today. It will matter for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Army Band Pershing's own Brass Quintet. Fly me to the moon, let me sail among the stars. Let let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, in other words. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mitch McConnell, Republican Leader of the United States Senate. The call that would make Larry Doby the first African-American player in the American League came in the middle of a doubleheader on the 4th of July. At 23 years old, Larry was already a married man, a war veteran, and the leading hitter for the Newark Eagles of the Negro Leagues. By that day in 1947, he got his biggest reminder yet that history, history doesn't wait around. Larry's call-up meant catching a train to meet his new Cleveland Indians teammates on the road in Chicago. But I have it on good authority that he quite nearly 
took a much shorter trip to follow Jackie Robinson to Brooklyn. If only my childhood favorite Dodgers could have been so fortunate. Larry Doby was more interested in making a name for himself with a hot bat than with the color of his skin. And he got right to work. Twice the American League home run leader, seven times an all-star, and a World Series champion to boot. Apparently, the year the Indians won it all in 1948, rumors even circulated that Larry was the only player since Babe Ruth to hit a home run over the center field wall at Old Griffith Stadium right here in Washington. But the man we honor today knew as well as anyone that no impressive performance at the plate could make unequal treatment in baseball disappear overnight. With a great deal less fanfare than number 42, Larry Doby endured the same discrimination that characterized the dark, segregated era America was slowly leaving behind. The separate restaurants on the road, the refused handshakes in the locker room, and the countless pitches that came much too high and inside. Even five years into his major league career, Larry still stayed with his local families during spring training because the team's hotel only admitted whites. That sort of treatment would entitle anyone to some hard feelings. But Larry Doby, the all-star, the Hall of Famer, the trailblazer, never admitted to carrying a grudge. Instead, he repeatedly chose the path of gratitude. Larry told anyone who asked that he'd been, quote, blessed with meeting a lot of good people. He chose to remember the unlikeliest friends, allies, and advocates who helped him make his historic career what it was. So today, we remember an exemplary American, an American League pioneer with the highest honor the Congress can bestow. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mike Johnson, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Well, this has been a, a beautiful ceremony and a testament to Larry Doby's obvious profound impact on professional athletics, race relations, civil rights, and American history. As the second black player to play in Major League Baseball and the first in the American League, Larry Doby was a pioneer, of course, we've heard, in the push to desegregate America's pastime. He faced many of the unspeakable atrocities that his predecessor Jackie Robinson faced, and we've heard about some of these today. He often sat and ate apart from his teammates. Opposing players levied racial epithets and spit tobacco at him, and team owners and managers initially refused to share the field with him. But like many young athletes, Larry just wanted to play ball. American popular culture and history remembers Jackie Robinson for being first, as we've heard today. Uh, but we're ensuring that America also remembers Larry's contributions to sport and society. If Jackie Robinson broke down the color barrier, then Larry Doby cleared the wreckage. And in doing so, he charted a path for black athletes that you can draw a direct line to today. The order in which they performed or reformed the sport is insignificant. What matters is what they did. And up until Larry took the field for the Indians in 1947, the existence of black athletes in professional sports was regarded as an experiment. His ascent to the major league was affirmation that they not only belonged, but they made the game much better. The cascading effect of his introduction to professional athletics cannot be understated. By the end of the summer of 1947, three more black players made their MLB debut. Four years later, 20 players had suited up for the MLB teams, MLB teams, and all professional teams were integrated before he retired from baseball in 1959. Independent of his efforts to desegregate professional baseball, he was a really good baseball player. Uh, good enough to warrant admission, of course, 
the Baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Scripture encourages us to, us to give honor where honor is due, and so I just want to recount one more time for the record today a few of these outstanding stats. Over his 13-year career, he hit 288. He led the league in home runs twice. He was named to seven consecutive All-Star teams, and alongside Satchel Paige was the first black player to win a World Series ring. It's remarkable. And he was known as a baseball player's ball player. Larry uh, played first base, second base, shortstop, and every position in the outfield. Even after his body began to break down, following two decades of professional baseball and his U.S. military service, he still kept playing. For his incomparable contributions to sport and society, the United States Mint has struck a specific gold medal in his honor. And on behalf of the United States Congress and the American people, it is my great honor and privilege to now deliver this medal to Larry's family. So I would ask uh, Larry Jr. to come and join me on the stage here, and also ask our delegation here in the front, Senator Brown, Senator Booker, Representative Clyburn, Re Representative Pascrell, Leader McConnell, and Leader Jeffries to join us on stage for the presentation and a photo. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Doby Jr. Whew. It's a great day today. And first thing I want to say is thank all you gentlemen for making it possible. We really appreciate it. My family, my sisters, we appreciate this. And I appreciate everybody that showed up, came long distances, broke engagements and, and showed up here for myself and my family to honor my father. Um, I hope I don't forget anybody. I'm gonna apologize first there. But this story obviously started 100 years ago today in South Carolina, believe it or not, when my father was born to Etta and David Doby. And as this gentleman said, that's where his roots were. And he came to New Jersey around 14 or so in Patterson and uh, attended Eastside High and made many great friends that he had till his, his dying day. And most importantly, met my mother. He was an only child and my mother was one of 10 Curvies. And so even if nobody came to root for him from his side of the family, he knew there would be 10 people that were rooting for him. And he was very happy. And these families were my Aunt Dot, who was a Tomlin, my Aunt Chick, who was a Brown, my Aunt Mary, who was a Veal, my Aunt Betty, who was a Brown, my Aunt Shirley, who was a Wilson, my Aunt Joan, who was a Rembert, and Uncle George Curvy, Uncle Donald Curvy, and Uncle Fred Curvy, who was here. <laughs> so after... After Patterson, he uh, played in the Negro Leagues, and he was uh, signed off of the, a tryout at Hinchcliffe Stadium, where he played high school baseball, football, and track. And Effa Manley was the owner of the North Eagles of the New Negro Leagues, and thought that he deserved a chance and gave him a chance. She happens to be the only woman in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And my oldest sister's godmother, correct? Okay. And then after that, with the, he went to uh, the Navy, and he was on a little island in the South Pacific called Ulithi. And he was one of the physical education instructors to help those guys get in shape, prepare for battle. While he was there, there were a couple of major leaguers who they would have pickup games, 
and play baseball and you know work out and stay in shape themselves. And one of them was Billy Goodman and the other one was Mickey Vernon. And Mickey Vernon thought my father had some talent and he wrote a letter to Mr. Griffin who owned the Washington Senators back in the day and said, I think you should give this guy a look. And I think that speaks volumes of what kind of person he was because my father could have possibly taken his job but he felt he was good enough to get an opportunity and he wrote a letter. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Washington's loss was Cleveland's game. So then along came a Mr. Bill Veck, who decided that it was time to integrate the American League. And he signed my dad. And it was a relationship that started early on and Mr. Veck said to my father, we're in this together. And that meant the world to my father. He meant he knew he had an ally somebody who when he was down or you know he was out would come and help him and often Mr. Veck would surprisingly show up in cities where my father wasn't playing too well and they both shared a love of jazz and they would go to jazz clubs together when he was doing pretty well Mr. Veck didn't show up but he did when he was doing pretty bad and this relationship I know was special to my dad he lost his father at eight years old and he always said that if his, if his father had lived, he would hope he would have been the kind of man that Mr. Veck was. And he looked at him kind of as a father, and our families are close. I love you, Mike Veck, and thank you for being here. So when he got to Cleveland, as they've stated, unfortunately, everybody wasn't so happy he got there. And there were people who didn't shake his hand, there were people who gave him the dead fish handshake, and there were a few who shook his hand. My father was far from perfect, as, as we know that none of us are perfect, Jesus is the only one who walked on this earth that was perfect. But one thing he was perfect at is he never mentioned the names of the guys who were the bad guys. So to this day, I don't know who they were. But it, the names that I heard in my house were the guys who looked out for him, the guys who made what he did possible. That was Steve Gromek, that was Joe Gordon, that was Jim Hegan, that was Bob Lemon. And for that, I thank their families and them up above for being there. Because what my father did, yes, he stood in that batter's box by himself, but everybody here knows how hard it is to hit. And if you have to try to perform when your mind is not clear and, and nobody's pulling for you, it makes it even harder. But those guys accepted him, and they were lifelong friends. And I'm just sorry I didn't get to meet some of them to thank them for their friendship. So then, after that, he retired and had moved to Montclair at some point. And he goes from Patterson, New Jersey, where he's a this celebrated athlete, where he grew up, where he played, where people knew his name. He was a household name. He goes to Montclair, New Jersey. When he goes to Montclair, New Jersey, who lives there? Who lives there, Lindsay? The most famous baseball player in the world, Yogi Berra. So whenever I would meet people and say I was from Montclair, they said to me, do you know Yogi Berra? I'm like, yeah, I do know him. So my father was humble. He was understated. It was, it was uh, a known fact in our house that he was never going to get in the Hall of Fame. Don't speak about it. When it happened, we were over the moon, but we kind of lived our lives with, you know, he's number two. He's not going to get recognized, and that's the way things were. Then he comes to Montclair, and same thing happens again. But I'll tell you this. From day one, when him and Yogi met, Yogi was one of the good guys. I heard his name. He treated him nice, with respect, welcomed him to the league and was one of the people that would have made it easier for him to make that transition from the Negro Leagues to the big leagues. So thank you, Yogi, too. So little old Montclair, um, you know, became our home. We were all born in Patterson, but we were all raised mainly in Montclair, my four sisters. Christina, who is here, my sister Leslie, my sister Kim, and my sister Susan, all Montclair High graduates, pretty much. But Montclair is famous for some other things. First of all, Mr. Yogi Berra has a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And then uh, Mr. Charles Everett Marone, Malone has the uh, same Congressional Gold Medal. He was a Tuskegee Airman, and his son is one of my best friends. And then Buzz Aldrin, who was the number two man to walk on the moon, as my father was number two in the big leagues, is also from Montclair. So he comes from pretty good company in that town also. Okay, so I'm gonna give my little, little speech about politics here, and I'm gonna say this, guys. I know that there's an aisle in between that, that sits in you, but it's not a barrier. It's, it's invisible. You guys need to reach your hands across. You need to 
cooperate, you need to compromise, and you need to coexist. This is the greatest country in the world, and it's the best when Republicans and Democrats are working together and ideas come from both sides. Nobody on either side has all the answers. You got to listen to each other. So they said, uh, let us not seek the Republican or Democratic answer. Let us seek to fix the blame. Let us not seek to fix the blame on the past, but let us accept our own responsibilities for the future. That's John F. Kennedy. So please remember that. And I'm going to give you another famous quote from Helen Dobie when I went to school. Play nice with the other children. <laughs> so please do that. And lastly, there's, after my father um, retired, he started coaching, and there were some great relationships made there. You know, he had a chance to coach some great players to influence them to just kind of tell his story and help them out in life. And some of those people are here. A lot of them couldn't be here, but please bear with me as I name these people. So this, his first job was in Montreal Expos, and. It was, um, there were some names I just want to. So Rusty Staub, Bill Stoneman, John Bateman, Ken Singleton, Mike Jorgensen, Tim Foley, Ellis Valentine, Jerry White, Warren Cromarty, Andre Dawson, Steve Rogers, Gary Carter, and Larry Parrish. Then he went to Cleveland and coached back there for a year. And the guys that kind of influenced him and made an impression on him were Charlie Spikes, George Hendrick, Oscar Gamble and Gaylord Perry. And the last place that he coached was with the Chicago White Sox, which was managed by Bob Lemon, who was a teammate of his. But Chet Lemon, Richie Zisk, Eric Soderholm, Oscar Gamble was there again, Lamar Johnson, Ron Bloomberg, George Order, and Harold Baines. So I'd like to acknowledge them. Um, I've had a wonderful time here. This means the world to my family. He's normally recognized only for what he did on the field, but this kind of says he was a pretty good guy off the field, and he, he helped advance his country, and he would be extremely proud and humbled by this honor. He would be humbled that all of you guys decided to show up. He'd be happy you were here, though, Uncle Fred. <laughs> and um, I just want to say it's, it's a wonderful honor. I appreciate it. My family appreciates it. And um, thank you, Dana Planning, for all your help from Irmo, South Carolina, from the Speaker's office. We appreciate you telling us where to be, what to do, and how to get there. It's a wonderful honor. It, it will always be close to my heart, and I thank all you guys from the bottom of my heart.